Lee. Hello, welcome to the MMU Philosophy Society podcast. My name is Harry. And my name's um, Alan. We're both in like third year. Yeah. And today we're going to uh, talk about how hot philosophers are. So one time I was in the pub with Harry and, you know, we're just having conversation, you know, like going back and forth. And then one day Harry asked me the question, um, who is the sexiest philosopher? Who is the hottest philosopher out there? And yeah, kind of spiraled into this massive, like, you know, discussion. And we thought, yo, this will be a brilliant podcast topic. You know, this will be brilliant to discuss on the podcast. So as I say, um, I think that the conclusion is that it's Kierkegaard, to be honest. I think that Kierkegaard, from the sketch, unless that sketch on the cover of his book was just like way too flattering. Mm -hmm. No, and, and like, I'm not sure if there's any like, truly realistic representations of him but he look, you know he's, he's pretty uh he looks like a nubile waif you know like a, a like a what do you call him a, a twink a twink yeah he looks like a twink you know like <laughs> that the ultimate twink like if you're into like if you're into that then take a look this guy is clearly he's like, elfin like, yeah he's like elfin yeah he's definitely like you know i don't want to say feminine but I think that is pos- it's possible that the the, the the depicted him very flatteringly, you know, mm-hmm. possibly. I mean, do you th- was he rich though? Like, did he have like the like you know economic means to be portrayed in that manner? Because I mean, he was narr- He was like a gentleman, you know. He was a gentleman of leisure, oh. you know, doing philosophy. He wasn't working in the factories or whatever. I think that there was something yeah. about how he dumped his girlfriend because he he was. Uh, he, he was afraid that he couldn't love her as much as she deserved or whatever, so he just gave her the cold shoulder and cut her out of his life or something like that. Not gonna, not gonna lie, that sounds like probably the most Kierkegaard thing to do. Mm, he was a very romantic <laughs> soul or whatever, very dramatic, you know, <laughs> over-dramatizing things, you know. Anyway. I think of romantic souls, though. Um, I actually kind of feel Camus is probably the hottest of them all. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, he's a bit, yeah, I don't know, he's a bit grizzled, isn't he? It, smoke it, too it, many it, unfiltered it, cigarettes, you know. I mean, but that's a se- in a sexy way though. He he carried himself across and um he's at, he's he's fucking athletic as well. Like he was literally he was a professional footballer. Oh really? As well as philosopher, so he doesn't just have that Plato thing going on where he's an athlete and you mm. know also a philosopher, but also I like, just look at this man. Mm. Yeah. It reminds me of that dude, what do you call him, uh, of Casablanca? What do you call that guy? Uh, Bogart. Humphrey Bogart? Humphrey Bogart? Is that right? Wait, Humphrey let me pull Bogart? up. Um, it, looking at you, kid. Humphrey, Humphrey yeah, that guy? Yeah. That guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I kind of see it, but actually, I see it a lot now. He looks a lot like Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. You know? He's just one of those um, ones where people have decided that he's good looking for some reason, but he's, I don't think he is, you know? You don't think he is? Why not? It's just the power of his charisma or something, you know? He had a lot of charisma. <laughs> charisma? You think it was just his charisma? The charisma, just like, uh, yeah, I think. It's hard to tell he's attractive from back then because of the black and white, you know? Yeah, they all just enough. look a bit funny. And I think they all wore like a load of makeup, like when they were doing their films and stuff. And like, uh, you know, they all look a bit strange. Yeah. Can you argue that um, Kierkegaard had the same thing where he doesn't actually look like what he probably looked like? Maybe he drew that picture of himself, you know. Maybe really he was a bit, you know, Phantom of the Opera esque. But he. To be fair, that, you know, I, that wouldn't surprise me in any means. That wouldn't surprise me by any means if he was Phantom of the Opera S. Mm. I think he lived in a loft and wore a cape, you know, and fluttered about <laughs> the Denmark, you know, <laughs> swishing his cape around and talking about existentialism and stuff. And about how um, I find Kierkegaard really interesting, actually, because many people associate existentialism with like atheism, but he's, he was actually very religious. I don't know, but like making the leap of faith. You've got to make the leap of faith like Abraham does when he's going to sacrifice his son. Yeah, that's what I think it was. Yeah, like... Would you have sacrificed your son if God told you to? Um, No, because I honestly, like, if I was in that situation, I would have been like, this is kind of like 
an acid, a bad acid trip telling me to do something stupid. I'm not going to do that stupid thing if. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like if the, I, being on psychedelics and you get the urge to run down the street naked or whatever, you've got to resist. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, like sometimes, I mean, whenever I've had that happen, I've had to be like, no, this is just me on psychedelics. I'm going to end up looking like an absolute cock, you know, like. Yeah. Aram, Aram, you could go and live in the woods. Go live in the woods, you know, like when you get those whispers, you know, just yeah, abandon yeah. everything, go to the woods. Maybe You'll survive. I'll Maybe I'll do a Unabomber thing, and next thing you know, um, Boris Johnson's found, you know. Mm. I mean, that's something that'd be said about psychedelics, you know, like how people, you know, we think of them as being like a good thing, you know, like, and it dissolves mm -hmm. boundaries and opens people up. Yeah. But like, what about the Unabomber? What about like Charles Manson, you know, because like him and his followers, they were taking a bunch of acid, you know, all the time. And like, it didn't really, you know, they were like violent and depraved, you know, so... That's because, I mean, also when you dissolve the bound those boundaries, you become kind of easy to commit, like manipulate. So let's say, you know, you're on something like, you're very impressionable, you know, you're very, like, it's very easy to, so if someone puts on that impression, so let's say Charles Manson was like, oh, we need to kill these people. You can put that impression on when someone is on psychedelics. And yeah, like, although they're great things, they can easily be manipulated. Yeah. I think the CIA did that a lot, a lot as well, you know, like about MK Ultra and stuff where the CIA yeah. were like feeding people acid. And there was like a time period where they would spike like other members of the CIA with like acid just to see what would happen, you know? So like, yeah. I think people died like from jumping out of windows and stuff because like the CIA would have meetings and they would all spike each other with acid in the water mm -hmm. and they would all just be like tripping <laughs> balls, like trying to decide whether acid was like a mind control drug or an anti mind control <clears throat> drug or a truth serum or like, you know, we're just fascinated by this substance and giving it to as many people as possible. Not gonna lie, that sounds like if the movie Climax got like combined with like a CIA detective show or something. The movie what? The movie Climax. Oh, I haven't seen basically, that. What's that? Basically, it's um where um some guys they basically um <clears throat> someone it's like a whole dance troupe and stuff like um they're celebrating their latest like dance performance where they've absolutely smashed and stuff. But then what happens is um someone halfway in someone puts like, like dro literal drops of like lsd like not even tabs but you know like literal liquid lsd mm. that's like super oh, they put oh. droplets in the punch and then because people don't know they're tripping and stuff they everyone starts going mad because someone starts having a bad trip and then someone else starts having and it just becomes pure chaos check it out climax and they start killing each other don't they yeah they do um yeah, they do. Yeah, like I won't spoil it for you. Actually, I won't I think spoil that, it. That's a mischaracterization, isn't it? Because I think like when you're on those drugs, like killing someone's the last thing that you're going to do, isn't it? Because it's like everything's so intense. I mean, I, I, you know, I doubt that you'd be able to do anyone any harm. But it's like you know, pure panic and stuff. Like everyone's in. Sometimes it's even like by accident or whatever. Sometimes it's like, oh, who spiked us? And you know, mm. when they're trying to find out whoever spiked them, they. It's fucking, I won't spoil it for you. Just watch Climax. Anyone watching this podcast, watch Climax. I'm kind of fascinated by that idea of like group psychedelic ecstasy, you know? Like, because if you think about like like thousands of years ago in like prehistoric times, like when they were, when we're living as hunter gatherers and tribes, and like, you know, like we're in Africa when like the mushroom would be abundant in the grasslands, you know, because the, the mushroom yeah. grows in the stool of mm -hmm. cows. And so, like, yeah. we would take these, you know, you, have you heard, like, Terence McKenna and his theories? Of course, yeah, of course I know Terence McKenna. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, like, when oh. he says that, like, we, we, we took the mushroom because in low doses, the mushroom gives you acute eyesight. And so, like, oh, yeah. we, would, we would involve the psilocybin mushroom in our diets, and it would influence the progress of evolution. And so, like, we would have, like, these group psychedelic ecstasies. Uh, that would that would be so weird, you know. Like imagine like a whole tribe, mm. multi-generational, like you, your parents, your grandparents, all taking psychedelics at once and having like a massive psychedelic episode. That would be so intense, you know. Yeah. On speaking of like Terrence McKenna, like when would you rank him? Like how sexy do you think <laughs> this man is? It's hard to say. I mean, because there's not really many women philosophers, is there? So I mean, like judging men on their sexiness, I don't know how sexy Terrence McKenna is. I'd have to ask someone like. Of that inclination, I say he's all right. You know, he's he's. I'd say like you know, it's not just about like what's conventional. It's about what vibe you give off. And 
Thomas McKenna just gives off a good, like, a good vibe, you feel me? Mm, he's got a very intense thing going on in that black and white picture with the glasses, the very intense vibes. Yeah. So imagine um, he just looks at you and say, says, hey, do you want to come home tonight? <laughs> with that look, imagine it. <laughs> you want to come home and do some mushrooms? Yes. Five grams <laughs> in complete darkness. Mm, yeah, five grams in darkness. I mean, not gonna lie, even I, I'd take that offer. If he just finally pulled up and said, hey, do you want to take five grams of mushrooms in? <laughs> I'd, I'd certainly. If he pulled up and hollered at you from out of his car. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, if he pulled up and hollered at me, I'd, I'd be like, sure thing, bro. You're Terence McKenna. You're the god of like psychedelic research. Mm. Or at least you were the god. Yeah. Like, um, speaking of female philosophers, though, like, I mean, one that springs to mind, I think, the Beauvoir. Mm. The Beauvoir, like. I think we're getting into dangerous territory here, like ranking female philosophers based on their attractiveness. It's pretty anti feminist, you know. I think that we're going to be cancelled yeah. for this, to be honest. I hear true that, true that. Um, but, I mean, to fair, though, you can spin this topic on to, like, you know, not necessarily who the sexiest philosophers are, but what is sexy philosophy? Mm. So, like, um, Nietzsche. Yeah. Nietzsche, yeah, Nietzsche is very, because it's all about, like, you know, taking control. It's all about, like, you know, being your own man, like, you know, asserting. I mean, things with Nietzsche, you can reframe it in many different ways. Like, mm. on one hand, it can be very empowering, but on the other hand, it can just be very much demeaning. It's like, you know, if the ubermensch is the one who takes control, you feel me, who takes control of society, or the ubermensch is like some master of race. I'm not sure it's about taking control. I mean, I always interpret it as like the difference between active and reactive forces. So like Nietzsche says yeah. that uh, there's active forces and reactive forces, and active forces just do what they do without uh, like reference to anything. So it's like producing mm. and being creative. And then like yeah. reactive forces respond to active forces and try and shut them mm -hmm. down you know so yeah. like you know someone creates an artwork that's an active force and then the reactive forces to say oh no that's not art. that's not good art or whatever and mm -hmm. so like and obviously Nietzsche's on the side of like uh, active forces isn't he and so that's quite yeah. sexy isn't it because it's all about like <laughs> being kind of throwing yourself into life and throwing yourself yeah. into the world and creation so I will ask this I will ask this person out you know I will I will be the active force in my life I will Mm. Go for it, you feel me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, like, That's a pretty sexy yeah. philosopher, but I don't think Nietzsche was a very sexy guy because he just kind of like he was a bit of a misanthrope, shut himself up, didn't he? Like, uh, you know, he was a bit of a mm -hmm. incel. He tried though. He tried. What, what I've heard, he tried. Like, he t apparently he we did the thing where he chased the same like girl for ten years, uh... and it, and it just never worked out because he was with Nietzsche. I feel he was his whole philosophy was him compensate for the fact that he himself didn't have like the courage to do what his philosophy supports like you doing. You feel me? I don't really know much about his biography. I didn't know that about the woman. You think you know? It's yeah. funny, like how philosophers, you know, like certain, like sometimes they contradict their own philosophies and their private lives and stuff. You know, I mean, like, Engels was literally. I mean, so, Engels. You know, I mean, Engels was literally a factory owner. Mm, yeah. You'd think he would have changed it into a worker co-op like, um, or something. Mm -hmm. But now, nah, like, um, I think he realised that, you know, even though I own this factory, I'm going to use the money from this to support, like, Karl Marx and stuff, to support, like, my mate Marx. And, so, yeah, even though it was kind of hypocritical, like, I think he recognised that you've got to use the material conditions in order to fight capitalist class so yeah i mean that yeah. that kind of like highlights a problem with communism doesn't it where it's like it's still certain people in control like instead of mm -hmm. leaving it you know that's why i like i'm i have more of a sympathy with like direct democracy where it's like you just mm -hmm. you kind of you just give the factory to the people and you allow them to come to their yeah. own uh conclusions about what should mm -hmm. be done with it and stuff whereas in communism there's still like this sense of like a a ruling elite class who who kind of take charge of the decision making and stuff mm -hmm. i think it's with um with that though the ruling class is it is the people though so it's kind of like like direct democracy but at the same time it acknowledges like the ruling class is still angles isn't it 
Would you say the ruling class is what? It's still like an elite group of people who take control, like like no. the Stalin's government and and Engels who controlled the factory, and he, he didn't just give it to the people. No, there's not like um, there's not like a vanguard part. There's not like you know there is a vanguard party and stuff. There are there was like a political party which may, but the way it's operated is through like you know direct democracy. It's through like certain like channels that like you know you can have something resembling. A direct, like a direct democracy and then eventually over time as you know communism spreads over you kind of allow for direct democracy to like happen you feel me as like when the material conditions kind of mm. adapt like it's more of um it's not like oh let's go straight to like anarchist direct democracy it's like oh we'll establish a society with workers control then that's what I yeah. find a bit suspicious because I think that no, like democracy, it should be like democracy now, not like a postponed democracy because the people mm -hmm. don't know what's good for them or whatever. Like I feel like no, you should just let the people make their own decisions and stuff and, and not control them. You know. I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah, like um, <clears throat> I get what you're saying there because um, but yeah, we do have direct democratic structures. It's like that workplaces are controlled democratically within. I'm not denying that, but. Like what we're saying is that, you know, it's a more organized, you feel me? It's in a more organized manner. Cause like, you know, post-revolution, not everyone's gonna be like on the same page, you feel me? Not everyone's gonna be able to, yeah. you know, run society. So it's kind of like, um, I don't wanna say realistic cause that's trying like putting you down in a way, but like, mm. it's kind of a more pragmatic outlook in a way. Sure, yeah. I, mean, I, I suppose I get the pragmatism. But I just feel like all kind of, coercion gives me yeah. the, the creeps a bit you know because there's still like an mm -hmm. element of coercion in, in that i mean you see it in obviously in like the soviet union where if you if you disagreed with uh you know the the commands of the party you would be killed or put in the gulag or whatever yeah and i just like i don't really like that kind of coercive i mean obviously you would still have mm -hmm. to have that to, to a degree because you know you still need to if someone's breaking the law and killing people and hurting people you need to lock them up or whatever mm -hmm. but i just don't like mm -hmm. that sense of like I don't like that the fact where if you disagree with someone on an ideological point, someone's going to come along and beat you up with a truncheon or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't feel that's inherently a part of communism, though. Mm. That's not an inherent part of it. Like, you know, that happens within communist regimes. Um, and they are what, and what I like to call that, like, you know, degenerated like worker states. So you have a worker state, but then let's say a Stalin takes power power whatever it kind of like degenerates in a way into something that's you can't create your own like ruling class like Stalin created his own of like bureaucratic elites and stuff and yeah like most communists don't support what Stalin did like there's a difference between Stalinism and stuff like Trotskyism even like you know more basic forms of like Leninism like yeah. so he perverted it he perverted mm -hmm. the communism if, Speaking of perverted um, Stalinism is not a sexy philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. I, did, I think that the throne, you know, I'd like to live in a world where like the throne stays empty, you know, and that no mm -hmm. one kind yeah, of like yeah. feels that they need to like impose their will on people and say, oh no, this no. is what this is right. This, you know, and, and you have to listen to me kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. I think that we should kind of yeah. like that. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I fully get you. It's like, Thing is, when you actually look at someone like Nietzsche, he would actually support like getting rid of the throne entirely because the throne is kind of what stops you from taking your from like world power, kind of what stops you from like you know having control over your life in a way. So like if you look at the Ubermensch and stuff, if you take Nietzsche's philosophy of the Ubermensch to its natural conclusion, um, it would be better to have a system where everyone can be an Ubermensch. You feel me? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, so, as a consequence, we should get rid of these power structures because they're stopping people from, you know, being being who they want to be. It's all based on the idea of like the idea that someone could control yeah. society. It's still based on this idea of the individual, isn't it? Yeah. Where like there are like we are a bunch of separate individuals and one of us has control mm -hmm. over the others or whatever. Whereas really, I don't think that in reality, it's like that, you know, like I think that that kind of individuate and process whereby we're all told that we are 
I am one person and you're another person and this is another person. I think that is a kind of tool of power mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I think it's part of that, of the system yeah. that allows people to control people, you know, because mm-hmm. you have to tell people that they're people yeah. in order to control them kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Whereas in reality, so, we're more like a swirl of desires and ideas, yeah. and, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so what you're saying is the concrete notion of a human, like, you know, I mean, a lot of concrete notions in general is used to put people down, you feel me? Like, so, cause, I mean, honestly, like, you see that with a lot of, like, you know, formal logic or whatever, um, it is used to put people down or to say, like, you know, humans have, like, certain innate traits that's used to, you know, you can apply the society's traits and say that they're innate to humans, they're innate to you. Yeah. It's like like Aristotelian, what is that law in Aristotle where it's like, a, it can't be a and not a, it's like either or, either this or that, you know, not both. Mm-hmm. It's like inherently kind of like dichotomizing. It's inherently mm-hmm. kind of like a straitjacket, whereas it really, you can be kind of, things aren't so black and white, you know? No. Things are more um, fluid, mm-hmm. you know, in all kinds of different um, respects. What I'm saying about control, that's probably why one reason why Aristotle's philosophy was so popular, you know, up until maybe the 15th century. And that's why almost all philosophers like, in the Western world were based upon like Aristotle, or at least most of them. Like, you know, let's say someone like Aquinas or whatever, who was like the dominant philosopher in the Middle Ages, he was all based on Aristotle. Literally everyone, every single science, every single, like, you know, philosophy was based upon Aristotle, not necessarily just because he had good ideas, but because these ideas were useful in controlling a population, you feel me? Mm, yeah, like, and he came up with the species, didn't he, where it's like, yeah, he was a philosopher of classification, so he's like, he's just trying to classify everything and like, well-defined mm-hmm. categories of this is this and this is that and, you know, yeah. genera and species and stuff. And really, I think mm-hmm. that we should try and declassify things because I don't think reality is as simple as as, as that, mm. isn't it? Where it's like everything can be broken down into these well-understood categories. I think, like, you know, when it comes to classification, you should look, not necessarily look at concrete things, but look at, like, tendencies, like, if you want to classify. So let's say, not like humans are this, or, like, humans are featherless bipeds, for example, as Plato said. You could say, like, humans tend to have these traits. Humans tend to do... Like this, you get me. Like mm. you, you can look at it on a basis of like this is how it is. Mm. You look at this has a tendency to be like this. Mm. But there's still an yeah. element in that of like of what a human should be, like a yeah, yeah. tendency towards you know like this idea of like what a human is, and then anything that deviates from that standard isn't properly human. You know, like like mm-hmm. Le- Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, which is like the organism par excellence, where it's like that's what a human being is. And then everything yeah. that isn't that is mm-hmm. somehow lacking, you know? So like a woman is like, she, she's not as human as a man or like an animal, you, you no. know, like this idea of yeah. a perfect standard, which I think mm-hmm. that we should dispense with, you know, I don't think that we should have like a, an idea of like what it means to be human that, that no. excludes certain other, yeah, I think that we should get rid of that category of the human, you know? Cause I, you know, the thing is with the human, it's a fluid, the fluid concept, yes, you know, people may have the genus of like a human or whatever, people may be genetically human, but not everyone who's genetically human has, not even just like the same traits, but like, you know, similar traits, so even something like language, not all humans have language, that's not innate to us, so if you look at like um, field children, you know, like field children in the world or whatever, they don't have language, they can't speak anything, not even like a wolf language or whatever. Like, so you could argue that um, humans don't actually have innate traits. Yeah. yeah. And furthermore, um, the notions of humans having like, you know, innate traits um, and the concept of human nature, what a human should be, is very much interlinked with like oppression. So there's a really good philosopher called David Hull. Have you heard of him or? Uh, no, no. He, he does. He has a really good paper, it's called On Human Nature, where he basically dispels the notion that we have like a fixed human nature, mm. but then goes on to say that the notion of a fixed human nature is used to justify stuff like homophobia. Mm. 
like you know men are naturally this way like men are naturally like you know hard strong whatever like but so like the homosexual is deviating from the norm kind of thing exactly yeah Yeah. like the homosexual is deviating from the norm you know black people are Mm. dumber because of certain like you know standards of like intelligence like good about like iq testing or whatever like mm. literally formal classifications of like what humans should be is mm. like the root of what a lot of oppression yeah yeah i mean there's another problem with like the idea of the human as well and that it divides us from nature you know it's like mm. the human world and the natural world like they're two separate things but it's really i yeah. think that it's really hard to put the, your finger on where the division between the human life and the nat- natural world is in reality, you know, mm-hmm. because it's like a field is natural or like a forest is natural, but a field is human, you know, like a, a mm-hmm. plant is natural, but a human leg is, is hu- like, it's, it's very flimsy, flimsy category. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I mean, we create things that are man-made, you know, but they're still, even if it's not a part of traditional, nature is all like us reshaping like nature and stuff with our as a species and stuff like even even if we seem to live far away from nature we are not fully like disconnected from it yeah but how i don't understand how you could be disconnected from nature in any way because like where would that disconnection be you know like where's the separation between the natural and the human um okay no, you can't really, there isn't really a separation, like, you know, we are directly connected to the natural world and stuff, like, mm-hmm. there isn't, ultimately, there is no separation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what I feel, I, like, I feel like, and you know, like, this idea that, like, each of us is an individual human subject, so, like, mm-hmm. for instance, if I move my hand, that's me moving my hand. But if, if yeah. like the, when the sun moves across the sky, that's something that's just part of the natural world or whatever. I think mm-hmm. that we should destroy that classification. You know, I think that we should see like our bodies as being totally continuous with the, with the natural world, you know, like mm-hmm. this idea that there's some kind of separate agent living in the body controlling different parts of the body. Yeah. I think is a, is a, is a weird idea, you know, for, mm-hmm. in my opinion. In, I guess, I guess one thing you could say in response to that is that it's easier to classify us as like, you know, separate individuals so let's say you have like um i know let's say like philosophy is something you apply to reality and stuff let's say philosophy is something like you apply to your life or whatever then it kind of makes more sense to think of you as an individual thing because the way you make decisions and stuff the way you interact with the world it very much simulates that you are you know an individual like being Mm. so but is it that it's practical and useful in itself or is it practical and useful because that's the way that we think you know like isn't it that <laughs> we already think in like we're individuals and, and therefore it becomes practical to think of us like that you know like mm-hmm. but it's, it seems to me like it's part of the culture rather than some kind of inherent uh category that appears naturally in itself yeah like i hear true because the human mind is very like plastic or whatever it's very much it's not fixed like you know it doesn't work on a fixed form of like logic like you know when you you learn from an early age or whatever you're kind of conditioned to think in this way of humans as separate from like nature Mm, kind of conditioned in a way it's not something you innately think it's just something like yeah so like when you're let's say if you got a kid you taught him that you're part of nature you don't have a separate sense of self like you know what you're saying then it would be a lot easier to like rationalize that you feel me. That still gives me the heebie-jeebies though. I mean, cause that would be the necessary conclusion of what I'm saying, but I, it does give me the heebie-jeebies, like the idea of not True. giving a kid a sense of individual selfhood or whatever. Like, like I think yeah. that you might like mess up the psychology a little bit if you do that. Yeah. That's the trouble with this worldview. That's the trouble Like you know, it, it's hard to make it seem, you know, to apply you feel me. Like yeah. when you try it, just, you know, when it doesn't make sense with the way humans interact with the natural world, you feel me? Mm-hmm. Sure. Maybe you have like, to grow through the stage of like, of thinking of yourself as an individual, maybe like it's a necessary mm-hmm. stage of development, like, because like the baby doesn't have any um, self, any identity. So like the baby doesn't perceive like any difference between its body mm-hmm. and its mother's body. And then gradually mm-hmm. as time goes by, you, you build this sense of personal identity. 
And then, but I think that maybe you should go beyond that and like get rid of that sense of being an individual and kind of return to a kind of mm -hmm. feeling of oneness with the with the world. But maybe it is necessary to pass through that stage of individuation. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you know, like, can you argue that like you can still retain that sense of individuality? So, let's say you look at a, let's say you look at the world like a person, a person that's wrinkles. Right, those wrinkles are. They're still a part of the person, but they're different. So you and I, Harry, are like two kind of different wrinkles on the body of like the world, you feel me? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you can still retain that sense of self. You can still be like, you know, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a sexy wrinkle or whatever. But well, like, I guess if you totally got rid of it, you would like, it, it would like negatively impact your life because you wouldn't be able to kind of like, you, you do need mm -hmm. that kind of sense of like this is my body this is your body so that like when we're eating i don't put food in your mouth and you don't put food mm -hmm. in my mouth you know we'll put you know like yeah you have to have that certain sense of kind of mm -hmm. um individual mm -hmm. I, I see what you're saying about the, the practical use of it yeah like i feel like even if we are like interconnected as you say like you can still have that individual sense of self mm -hmm. it's like you know Let's say the world is a giant body or what, like, you know, as I was just saying, we're just parts of that body. We're different, you know, mm -hmm. we're like, like, you know, different parts of the makeup of the body that is the world in a way. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think your views are too different from having a sense of personal, I don't think having a sense of personal identity is something that you know you can't have with your world view you get me oh no 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 not at all i mean i still have a you know so i don't think that it's wrong to have a sense of personal identity no yeah it's just that you know you can just think of people as like what you're saying is people aren't like you know different entities they're part of like one entity but like hmm. which is nature sure yeah in the same way that different body parts constitute a whole that is the body like mm -hmm. we constitute a whole, which yeah. is the universe or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Very sexy philosophy. So what's our conclusion? Oh, yeah, that's a sexy philosophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's the least sexy philosophy? Um, oh, I've got a good one. I've got a really good answer for that. Have you heard of logical positivism? Ah, uh, yeah, logical positivism. <laughs> Have you heard of... <laughs> that is... Carry on, what were you saying? Oh, no, yeah, yeah. It's the least sexy philosophy, yeah. Because um, it's basically like, if you guys don't know, because you don't do this at Man Met, they don't teach you about logical positivism at Man Met. Um, basically, it's like the probably like the most bastardized form of analytic philosophy you can get out there, which basically um, the belief that the only meaningful philosoph philosophical like, you know, problems are those that can be solved by like, empirical science, like purely logical analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't go against like the continental ones. The continental guys are much sexier, you know. Like it's so dry, analytic stuff, you know. <laughs> but like, um, they have this um, their whole theory rests around this principle called the verification principle. Just like you know, if you can't empirically verify it, it's either you can empirically verify something or mm. you know it innately. Mm -hmm. Like those are the only two forms of knowledge. It's just like either, because they're, they're like soy boys, aren't they? They're like sucking up the science, you know? <laughs> they're like, it's like, sci oh, science is so good and we have to make philosophy exactly like science. It's weak. It's weak. Yeah. They need to stand on their own two feet. It's like if you see, um, it's almost as perverse as the, you know, like the new atheist movement? Oh, yeah. You know, like, um, the, that's like, oh, you can only have, like, science? Like, no, that's... I'm sorry, you can't just have science. Like science alone doesn't solve something like ethical problems or mm. something like like Sam I mean, Harris. It's quite useful. Yeah. yeah, but um the thing is the problem with the logical positivists is that their whole verification principle it falls apart when you actually use it on itself. So think about it. Either something is um analytically true, which is like you know. You, it's like mathematics, two plus two equals four, or it can be empirically verified. Those are the only two truths. But if you take something like, um, you know, the principle itself, 
you can't verify that principle as a universal law because it's not true by definition yeah so, and it's not empirically verifiable and so that's dead and sexy you know that they contradict themselves <laughs> not good i mean at least if you're trying to be unsexy on cool at least don't be dumb whilst doing it don't at least don't be stupid <laughs> but like um even still funnily enough there's actually an interview with one of the biggest like people in the logical positivist movement who literally admitted like he was wrong about it all yeah. Bertrand and, russell no aka a, oh. no aka i've heard of him um basically um aka at the end of his life um he had this whole interview where he basically admitted he was wrong. Because um, I remember when, and I was like, you know, trying to do better in philosophy. Because um, there was a time when I wasn't actually very good. Um, my mum found like a personal tutor. Like one of her mates was like a personal tutor for philosophy. And one of the first things he showed me was that video. Because the whole lesson was, it's okay to be wrong. Like, it's okay to admit when you're wrong. Sure. I mean, that's kind of sexy, like, you know, that's kind of, yeah. and that guy was. Yeah, you don't want to keep on saying something that's not right just to protect no. your ego or whatever. That's not sexy at all. No, because the thing is, um, honestly, dogmatism is one of the worst things you can do when you start learning about philosophy. Because, like, even, you know, as someone who does have certain political beliefs and stuff, I haven't let them just fully define my outlook on philosophy. I haven't. And whenever I've like done philosophy, whenever I've gone to like lectures or whatever, I haven't said, yo, this philosophy is wrong because it doesn't fit with my worldview. Like you've got to, even if you can have opinions, you can't dogmatically like keep to them, you get me? Yeah, that's something that I've learned, I think, over time is that like, you know, like when I first started, I would hear something and I would immediately try to criticize it in accordance with my own beliefs. But whereas mm -hmm. now, like I don't, you know, like I, I kind of, put my beliefs to the side for a second and try and like understand something like on its own terms or whatever before mm -hmm. I criticize it, you know, instead of just kind of jumping in and trying to tear it to pieces immediately, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I, feel, I feel that's what happens when you're first year though. Like when you're first year, you just want to tear everything apart. You feel like you know everything. You feel like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm the smartest like philosopher out there. Yeah. Like, oh, but then, I don't know, you kind of like learn over time that although you may be smart and stuff, you still shouldn't just try and tear everything down. Mm -hmm. It's not valuable. Like, exactly, yeah. Like, it's fun, but, you know, how is it going to impact my studies? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you, if you just did everything that was fun, then I'd be out on the sec every night. But as it is, I have to research my dissertation, so I can't be out on the sec. Yeah, but that's problematic in itself because it, would you really would you really be one of out on the sesh every night because then you'd have to deal with the hangover and stuff wouldn't you um i guess you power through like um, i know a guy i actually met a guy at the pub the other day who i think he got got home from night out at like six o'clock at night or something and then literally like only a few hours later but was back in the pub mm. like apart apparently like um yeah, some people can do that though. Some people can be out on the sec every night. I'm just not hardcore enough. I haven't got a strong enough yeah. liver for that kind of lifestyle. Apparently, um, I think I heard in Lithuania, like the top like hangover kill rather than drinking a glass of water as a shot of vodka. Mm. And you carry on to it. I heard about the hangover cure, the prairie oyster. What is the it's prairie? Like, it's like an egg, some black pepper, a shot of like a little bit of Tabasco sauce. It's like a lot of weird ingredients, and then you like shot the ticket as a shot. Like so it's kind of like Loki in a way. Kind of like what? I think because it's not like the egg and stuff. It's like you, Rocky when he drinks like the raw eggs in a way. Ah. Oh, Rocky, yeah, Rocky. Oh, I see yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Okay. yeah I, think I, I can look that up. Prairie oyster. Yeah, it's like Tabasco <laughs> sauce, but egg. Can't remember. It's funny what you're saying about analytical philosophy because that, I, I am kind of glad that I went to MMU, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. and, because it's more continental. Because I don't think that I would have liked the analytic stuff so much, you know. No, because I think it's analytic stuff, it's cool, but I don't know continental philosophy as much. It's better because like, at A level, I studied a lot of analytic stuff, and I was like, yeah, this is decent, but I'd rather study 
mm. continental stuff. And, and I mean, even at like MMU, um, we actually have like many top authorities on continental philosophy. So if you look at like Hen Henry Bergson, you know, oh, yeah. what he does, one of our lecturers, what he does, he's one of the top authorities on Henry Bergson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I never really thought of philosophy as like a science, you know, I always thought of it more yeah. like an art form, you know? Yeah. And so like, I think that that analytic thing where it's like, it's all very scientific and everything that has to be dead rigorous and it, it does mm -hmm. seem a little bit kind of um, restrictive. Yeah. Do you know what I find is like, you know, the good um, mean between like, you know, continental stuff and like analytic stuff. I feel dialectics like Heraclitus, Hegel, that's like a good mean between it. Because mm. like, you know, it's still, it isn't as restrictive as like, you know, analytical philosophy, but it still acknowledges the use of science. I mean, also it thinks about science in much better way like if you look at recent scientific developments they kind of prove a dialectical worldview more than like you know a analytic one you feel me what do you mean by a dialectical worldview so like um you know like stuff like you know Hegel, Heraclitus talks about yeah like it's, it's kind of harder to describe like you know everything is con in constant motion everything you know well, like what Heraclitus said I can't step in the same book twice and stuff like Everything is kind of like, you know, up to change, you feel me, like... Everything's in so, flow and flux and change yeah. all the time, right, right. Yeah, yeah that's so, one, yeah, that's it, yeah. I see. And, and, and like, science is, it, it, science, like, modern science is in agreement with that because of, like, quantum mechanics and stuff, and, and there's yeah, no, like, solid entities that are, everything's mm -hmm. kind of a swirl of quantum fluctuations. I mean, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, I mean, even, like, scientific laws and stuff, although I think part they're not always fixed laws they're kind of like you know tendencies so yes. if you look at the speed of light i think i heard about like i think didn't the speed of light change or something did that i, think I, I thought it was it changed i thought um i think it might have been i was discussing something with like bob or sam or something who by the way i've been on the podcast before they were like i heard about a philosopher who talked about how scientific laws like the speed of light sometimes change a little bit at certain points in history. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. I mean, also you do see certain like little particles. I think they're cesium particles, like that move faster than the speed of light, like slightly. Cesium particles? I, I, I think so. I can't remember what they are. Like Isn't certain tachyons or something that move backwards in time or something like that. I, I don't think cesium mm. particles would move faster than the speed of light because they've got mass. Oh. So, I mean, like, photons, they, they don't have any master, then that's why they can move at the speed of light. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that cesium particles could move at the speed of light. I think you might be, I think, I heard something about tachyons or something, whether, like, they can move backwards in time or something like that. Yeah, I think I'm confusing it with, tach with like, tachyons and stuff. Mm. But I think... No, I'm sorry. I'm oh, no, sorry, I, I wasn't. What were you going to say, sorry? But yeah, I was about to say that um, I feel tachyons, like... Um, this isn't like tachyons, like they kind of show that scientific laws, even though they're there, that they aren't as like rigid as that maybe an analytic tradition would say they are. Like, yeah. like what I feel is like, you know, you kind of need a little balance. Like you, you need to have concrete, you know, you need to acknowledge that concrete scientific things, but you can't be too rigid with them. You get me? Yeah. It's, it's like, the idea isn't it what like scientism where it's like only science has like the avenue to the truth and any other means other than science is invalid i think that's like mm -hmm. the problematic position because it's like yeah. there are like other ways of thinking other than scientific ways of thinking you know like science itself mm -hmm. is just like one branch of philosophy isn't it yeah like i mean that's what i'm saying when i say talk about analytic philosophy because i mean scientism is kind of like the natural conclusion of it if you feel me I suppose like um but yeah honestly like um <clears throat> yeah so science is important like i'm not saying fuck science right. like you need science like science is really an understanding like you know the truth that seem apparent around us but you do need other philosophies to like guide it mm, definitely like you know and i, I mean science, science can't no sorry 
Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, like, science always follows in the wake of experience, doesn't it? Because mm-hmm. what science analyzes is our experience, isn't it? Like, and yeah. so, so science is always kind of following in the wake of that. So, like, mm-hmm. science can't be totalizing as a system because mm-hmm. it's always kind mm-hmm. of following behind the empirical yeah. world, you know, of perception. Exactly. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's the thing with that, you know, science, you need prior basis to build it off of. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you need you need something to guide that science. Like, you can't just have science without guidance. I mean, that rhymes, by the way. But, like, you need... Yeah, yeah. You do need that driving force. Like, furthermore, certain questions, like ethical questions, science doesn't necessarily have an answer for. Mm. Because it's even like when, when you do science in, in practice, you always have to come up with a hypothesis, don't you? It's not like mm-hmm. you just... Because when you collect data, you're always collecting data in service of some kind of pre-imagined uh, hypothesis. So what, and the way that you come up with that hypothesis isn't necessarily scientific, it's more intuitive, isn't it? You know, mm-hmm. so in the heart of science, there is something unscientific, which is the generation of these hypotheses. Yeah. It's like, and I mean, even scientists will probably acknowledge themselves that, you know, you need, need a bit of that intuition, you need, like, I mean, it's even more like, you know, some things science can't really explain. So let's say when you're in deep meditation or whatever, you know, if you've ever been to like a Buddhist retreat, like sometimes you get into a deep meditative state that science just can't really explain. You feel this connection with the world that isn't, I mean, maybe science will explain it someday, but as it is, it can't really explain that feeling of spirituality, you get me? just consciousness in general isn't it is is a bit of a sticking point like Mm -hmm. the the trying to explain why we there are experiential phenomena in general is science Mm -hmm. seems to be kind of uh have difficulty with that like yeah the thing is i feel something like science it's it's really useful don't get don't get me wrong this is not an attack on science i fully support it's useful like at the same time there's certain things that you know either you can't really explain or it's very hard to explain so it's not like an all encompassing like worldview like okay. that's the, that's the problem with adopting like you know certain underlying like meta narratives as like you know dogmatic as dogma you feel me because mm-hmm. like you know i mean you can use certain meta narratives because they're more useful but you can adopt them in like a dogmatic like use. So science should be like a tool in our toolbox rather than like the total yes. way that we interact with reality or whatever. Certainly. Mm-hmm. How long have we been? How long is that? How long have we been doing? Maybe like 50 minutes, maybe? 50 minutes, you want to call it a day? Yeah, I'll call it a day, yeah, happily. All right. Signing off. They're signing off. Um, have a good one, lads, and catch you later.